Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast and those of you watching on video as well. My name is David Bonson. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at the Bonson Group and very grateful to once again be presenting you our weekly Dividend Cafe market commentary. I am recording before the market is opened on Friday and it has been an interesting week in the markets. It's three weeks in a row now. Coming into today here on Friday, the market is up about 700 points on the week. Um, the futures are pointing up about 100 points, but uh, you know who knows what the market will do today, Friday. But this would be three consecutive weeks in a row of the market being up, and that's you know that happens all the time. We almost got five days in a row of the market up. That doesn't happen very much, but um, uh, the market was not up uh, yesterday, Thursday. Uh, but the um, thing that is certainly noteworthy about the market this week and, and the last two weeks before that is that you have a three-week run of positive returns in the Dow while you're having the three-week surge or, or outbreak or case growth, you know, whatever uh, nouns and adjectives you like to capture what's going on at varying degrees of, of you know, reaction. And uh, it's heightened in Florida and Texas. Um, it had been heightened in Arizona. It started to, to back down there a little. Um, we use our COVID in markets daily writing and podcast to try to provide more holistic perspective around all of that. I won't dive into it all now, but I do think the market's response is indicative and you could say symbolic, but I also think substantive to where we stand with that. Uh, we, we are not out of the woods in, in the COVID health pandemic by any stretch. There are very serious things happening that will continue to be monitored and addressed, but there's also just simply a, a very different um, response, a very different awareness, very different understanding, very different, you know, facts on the ground to where we are now versus where we were in March and April. And market prices seem to be, in a weird way, one of the few aspects reflecting that understanding. So that's where we are with the market. There's a number of other things I'll talk about economically, but, but here's kind of um, something I want to do, elaborate on this week in, in light of my talk last week about trade-offs and and it was my statement that was uh there was a risk i think of it sounding patronizing and it was that was most certainly not my intent and i really appreciated some of the feedback i got and support uh you know gratitude for the analogy it seems to have been received well which is good about trade-offs in life being uh the understanding of trade-offs appreciation for trade-offs the reality of trade-offs is it being one of the marks of a grown-up and that it, it is a kind of exclusive um, understanding to the adult world that um, most of the decisions we make involve a trade-off, uh, that there is a risk-reward calculation, there's a cost-benefit calculation, um, but there's not uh, necessarily decisions we get to make very often that are all good. And, of course, there usually are not decisions um, that we make that are all bad either. Most of the time, we're, we're in some sort of a tension, and it can be of just a very minor issue. Um, you know, if I park here, it's closer, but if I park there, you know, like parking space stuff or whatever, I made that up right now. But I mean, my point being, there's kind of trivial ones that, that don't have a lot of significance in our day-to-day -day lives. And then there's really, really significant ones, um, a lot of ramifications. But, that's, but that's, that's life. And that's where we are in the COVID moment, the decisions we make and, and what we are willing to do and not do and health risks versus other needs and wants in our life. And, and of course, where I'm headed with this is going to be is more in specific to financials, you know, uh, on a real easy basis from just a cash spending standpoint. For most people, there's trade offs around uh, vacation they may take. You're going to get certain memories. You're going to have certain fun and enjoyment. There's going to be this certain opportunity 
uh, but then is spending that money um, on that vacation, it's it's sort of taking away from some future saving or, or opportunity or, or other expenditure you may want or what have you. And so so we go, we do these things, we make these decisions, we have these mental uh, conversations to evaluate and analyze the trade-off and make calculations. And so I already talked about this a little bit last week, but this week I was, let me just set it up real quick. I, um, you probably can't, maybe you can tell, maybe you can't. I had lost uh, uh, about 25 to 30 pounds from the middle of 2019 last year going into the quarantine. Um, and, and I had no interest with all the gyms closing and everything in going backwards on that, on that progress. I did not want to put the weight back on. I also, you know, I find exercise like most people to be very important from a, 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 a emotional spiritual standpoint in addition to the physical benefits and and I really was determined to uh, maintain some exercise throughout uh, quarantine and uh, we were at our home in California and I literally ran every single day every day um, I would get up or e even earlier than normal and work for about two and a half hours peer reading research markets every morning and then I'd go get in uh, two and a half or three mile run, and and a, lot, a few other little exercise things, and then and then get going back with my day, and so I've kept that going. I'm back out in New York now, and I've been running in Central Park every morning, and it's easier out here because you're in the Eastern Time Zone, so I have even more time for work, reading, writing, and a run, and more work things before the market opens at 9:30. It's one of the things I love about being in New York is the Eastern Time Zone suits my work life so much better. And I'm such a morning person anyways. But here's where I'm going with this. I it, I was running in my uh, neighborhood in California during quarantine um, by myself. And, or, and sometimes I'd run by, uh, you know, an older couple, uh, you know, walking together or something. But when you're running in Central Park, for any of you who've ever done it, you know, there's some like real serious runners. And there's a bunch of people. And so, you know, it, it, you can feel uh, inadequate real quickly. And I had this moment one day this week, I can't remember which day, of runners passing by. And I looked and saw this one gentleman, and he, and he was running at such a faster pace. He was in such good shape. And, and there was this sort of sense of like, I've been running every day for what is it now, four months? And, and I lost this weight and, 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 been, and so forth. And, and, you know, what would I have to do to be able to kind of be like, like this guy and, and have this sort of conditioning and, and, and what, you know what I'm saying. Um, I went to Del Frisco's that night and had a ribeye for dinner. Okay, um, this is the point I'm making. Um, I could run seven miles or ten miles a day or build up to that level, but I don't. I'm willing to do three miles, and maybe one day I'll do more. But I, it's a it's a trade off that I've made. It's a decision I've made of I want to work out, I need to work out, but I also have my work responsibilities. And this is that kind of calculus. This is the the push and pull of the competing interest in my life. Um, I also like to eat. That you know, I don't drink. I don't. I, I don't have all these other recreational activities. I love food. So I want to fit in my suits, but I, it's more important to me, at least whether I, well, I guess I'm admitting it now, but even if I didn't admit it, it really is just being honest and self-aware. It's more important to me to be able to enjoy a ribeye than it is to be at that really, really fit level of this uh, uh, runner wearing by me in Central Park. Um, that's not to say I don't care about exercise, and it's not to say that it, it's it's to say the trade-off is where we are. That there is this kind of equilibrium that has to be found, and that is exactly the case for investors when it comes to dealing with the comforts of a portfolio. One can say I want to remove some certain amounts of distress. And the trade-off will be that I will have lower income or cash flow or a lower growth rate or a lower long-term opportunity or a higher tax burden or something. 
and one can say, I'm, I'm willing, I want a higher return, I want this, that, and the other, and they will invite more volatility or more liquidity risk or more inflation or more tax burden or something. So those trade-offs, not just in the obvious categories from a personal financial planning standpoint of spending, you know, consumption now versus uh, uh, more money later, that, those things are all true, um, but they're a little bit obvious. But I think within the microcosms of investment decisions and in portfolio decisions and in asset allocation and in behavioral finance, those same principles are at play as to what goes into something so silly of an old dad who works 16 hours a day trying to figure out where exercise and food fit into his life. Um, there are people that just choose to not do exercise at all, and there are people who literally live for it, and, and, and most people find trade-offs in between. And I think that's exactly the situation in our investing lives. And the only reason I bring up the exercise example is because it's such an easy one, and I had this little moment this week in Central Park um, where, where I kind of went through the mental exercise myself. But it's true in so many other aspects of life, too. You know, you, you want to get to a place faster, but then you risk a speeding ticket or an accident or this or that. And I don't think we often are consciously thinking about it. You know, I went after my run and, and I sat down on the bench and was going through emails and doing some things. And I was like consciously thinking through all this stuff. I think that we most of the time are engaged in trade-off decisions without even having to think about it because it's embedded into human nature. It's embedded into the logic of human living. And in our lives as investors, it is really a matter of how aware of it we want to be because it's happening anyways. And, and the notion that we have temperamental, emotional, psychological level, uh, discomforts is there. And those things are often having to be properly um, harmonized with other wants and needs. And those trade-offs dictate where, um, where we end up. So I hope that's helpful. I, I won't stay on this theme forever. It, it's kind of embedded in, in our lives as, as investors, whether I bring it up each Friday or not, but I won't. I just hope that, that was some kind of uh, interesting anecdote um, to reinforce the principle from last week. Let me quickly look through here, DividendCafe.com today, the things that I've written about in today's market commentary. We've already talked about the market had done this week. I think that one of the next potential catalysts to markets um, is in wherever they end up going with this quote-unquote stimulus 4.0. Um, it's very obvious that the conversations have intensified around making something happen there. Uh, there is a sort of either artificial or not artificial gun um, from a timing standpoint because the unemployment uh, benefit, the supplement of $600 a week from the federal government ends in two weeks. And so there is the notion that look, we're nowhere near out of the woods. There is still uh, you know, many, many millions of unemployed people and some degree of additional support is needed because uh, I think to some degree, rightly, the belief is that those benefits have filled some of the gap for uh, consumers and so forth that uh, have less income. So the overall national income has benefited. But then on the other side of it, an equally and perhaps even more important point, and when I say more important, I mean macroeconomically, not to any individual, um, is that it is most certainly distorting our ability to get job restoration because there is some degree of people, it's high, it's not all of them, but it's high, that are earning more money to not be working than they would be to working. And so they have to be able to reconcile those two different things. I think they're going to extend it past July 31, um, but I don't think it's going to be at the full 600 a week. And so some compromise notion will come out of that. Uh, but President Trump did say this week he is still viewing a payroll tax cut as a line in the sand, as a, this must happen in order to get a stimulus done. That is interesting because it seemed as if they were letting go of it. I know there are other economic advisors in the White House that are adamant that that be there. 
I do not think the market has discounted that in whatsoever. I think that would be a huge boon to markets if there were a payroll tax cut that's implemented into stimulus. I'm skeptical the political will is there to get it done, but it's it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Um, the thing that is not two week away imminent, but is maybe two month away imminent, that's also lingering, producing some time pressure, is state and local relief, and that's going to end up being another big source of debate in the bill. Um, we know they're not going to go less than a trillion. The Senate GOP has already said they'll do a trillion. Uh, we know they're not going to get to three trillion where the House has said they want to be, the House Democrats. Um, so my view continues to be there'll be something between one and a half and 2.2, and that the president's probably willing to go on the higher end of that. Um, they are talking again about direct tax payments to taxpayers, although a lower threshold. So it would be a lower income level of people that were just getting money sent to them. Um, so there's a number of components that are on the table, but that whole package I just know is going to be sloppy getting done. It's obvious both sides are throwing things out there to, for political markers, and, I, and I'm just skeptical that they'll meet a two-week deadline, and I'm skeptical that they'll get it done smoothly. I think we're in for some real sausage making. So stimulus 4.0, we're in the middle of earnings season. Commodity prices are moving, industrial metals, lumber prices. I have charts in Dividend Cafe this week. Very hard to, um, to not see some of these reflationary things happening. Uh, whether or not the economy really gets going again in one month, three months, six months, there is some forward optimism, and I think that's good. Uh, I was basically surprised this week that the small business optimism number was as high as it was. Industrial productions moved in the right direction. Um, I've been saying and will continue to say those are the most important metrics, but me believing in their importance is not necessarily me believing that they're going to go where we want them to go. And right now it's looked pretty good. So those are some of the metrics that we want to look at. A lot of really interesting stuff about volatility, about municipal bonds, and about Europe in the Dividend Cafe this week. So please read the dividendcafe.com um, and, and get uh, a better understanding of all the stuff we're looking at. And I hope you can appreciate the anecdote I used. I'm sure there's nothing more thrilling to you than hearing about me jogging in Central Park and then eating a steak that night. But um, I don't know, it just seemed relevant to a lot of things going on in a weird way. So with that said, thank you as always for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Please reach out with any questions you may have, anything we at the Bonson Group can be doing to help you in these utterly crazy times. We are here and um, wish you a very wonderful weekend. Please share Dividend Cafe with anyone you'd like and rate us on your player of choice, whatever amount of stars you want to give, but um, subscribe and, and uh, it helps us in our podcast feeds and so forth. Okay. Thanks so much for listening to Divinity Cafe.